Welcome to the webinar, Understanding and Comparing Inequalities in Skill Development, from International Large-Scale large Assessments to Cross-National cross Longitudinal Studies. My name is Daniela Vono, and I'm the Deputy Executive Secretary of Population Europe, the network of 36 demographic institutes across Europe. This webinar we organized uh, in the framework of the project Development of Inequalities in Child Education Educational Achievement, a six country study, also uh, well, very well known as the DICE project. So this webinar will be divided in two parts. First, we will learn about research results from the DICE project. And second, we'll have a conversation with amazing experts on educational relation data, relate, related data. So to open the first part of this event, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our two speakers. I don't see Thorsten yet here, but he'll come. <laughs> so our first speaker is Anne Solas. She's senior researcher at the French Institute for Demographic Studies, ENET, in Paris. And our second speaker is Thorsten Schneider. He's professor of sociology, comparative analysis of contemporary societies at the Leipzig University in Germany. And the floor is yours, please. You feel free to share your slides. Did you see my slide? Yes, we can see the slides. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to discuss with the great experts of, uh, of this topic. It is uh, now. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, it's just not good. It's good. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, I couldn't, um, Okay. Okay. Sorry. So it is now uh, widely now the students' uh, achievement. And and sorry yeah. to interrupt you. We are seeing your presentation modes. Perhaps you can make the. Full screen. I see the full screen, so it's not so how can I do that? So if I try to do yeah, yeah. Is it okay now? Now we don't see anything. Yes, now and now it's perfect. Perhaps oh. you can you can move your mic a bit up. You because the microphone thank we are here. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Okay. So, so it is now widely uh, now the student achievement differ by social background uh, of their parents, and uh, this has been extended extensively shown by international large, large scale assessments such as PISA. And this is an illustration for four high income countries. The graphs show the gap in reading uh, performance between the children having a low educated mother relative to those having, having a medium educated mother in reference, as well as um, between those having a high educated mother relative to those having a medium educated mother. 
So you can see the magnitude of the parental educational gap uh, between low and high in the different countries and for both school level, um, for the prime, at the end of primary school on the left panel and uh, at the end of the lower secondary on the right panel. So the gaps are quite large, almost around one standard deviation and of similar magnitude in the four countries, whatever the, the school period, type a bit larger in uh, for US children. So showing this gap is very useful and could be done with cross-sectional data. As soon as we are able to compare both the child outcome and the social gratifying variables, such as here the, the, the mother education, but explaining the mechanism behind this gap is much more difficult and require generally longitudinal comparative data. This was mainly the aim of the European DICE project. The project aims at better understanding the disparities in child development in a broader sense, so it means not only in school uh, skills, but also in non-cognitive or else uh, outcomes by parental socioeconomic status. How these inequalities develop over childhood and adolescence. This is really important if you want to help policymakers to reduce such inequality. The project DICE, supervised by Liz Bashpur, regroups researchers from six different high income countries England, France, Germany, Netherlands, Japan, and US, and is based on nationally representative longitudinal database. Uh, one of the big challenge and big also uh, effort were to make comparable our main variable of interest without losing too much of the richness of the data set. We are going to go further in the added value of longitudinal data and comparability challenge by taking two examples of the DICE uh, result. The first one uh, is going to be presented by Thorsten, so maybe I, I could skip to the second one if Thorsten is not yet here. Thorsten is the right or no? I cannot see. Him. No, I cannot see him here. Okay. So I, I will take the second example first. And we hope that uh, he will join and us. Sorry yes. to sorry to interrupt you. Uh uh a person among the attendees wrote that your audio is not very good. So if you can move a bit the mic. Yes. Uh, maybe I can. Is it better now? Yes. Uh, yes. Maybe I increase the sound. <laughs> so the, the first example is about the role of family structure in explaining the gap that we have shown. Do you see the? I'm not sure you see the whole slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, this, uh, just to, to say some words around the context, children's life uh, is becoming more and more complex with the increase in parental separation over time and also the, the high risk of departing of the, the, the custodial parent and the substantial proportion of children do not live with both parents by age 10. Usually, children who are not living anymore with their two parents report less positive outcomes. As children from, but as children from low SOS are more likely to, to have disruptive family, we wonder to what extent family structure could account for the low high gap in reading or mathematics skills. With cross-sectional data, there is no real possibility to disentangle the true relationship between growing up outside two-parent family and the school score from the selection issue, family transition disproportionately, disproportionately affect already disadvantaged children. So with longitudinal data, we are able to control for the initial condition. 
So we study the gap in math and reading a score, but I will show here the result for, for one of them only, between children with a low educated mother and those with a high educated mother at the end of primary school and at the end of secondary school. The variable of interest is the family structure during the school period. And this variable is built in a way that we are able to distinguish change in family structure and from uh, change from, from, uh, from stability in family structure from the child point of view. So you can see that the children around primary could stay with stable parents, two parents all along the school or have a stable step family or belong to a single mother, but uh, always stable. Or on the river, they could have a transition during primary school from two parents to single mother, or a transition to a mother, uh, to a situation where he share his life with the mother and step father. So here you can see in blue what we have already seen, the, the, the cruise gate between children from low educated and highly educated in math score at the end of primary school in the US. And how much this graph show how much the introduction of variable could explain part of this low high year. This graph stresses three main reasons. First, the gap does not diminish so much when we add the family structure variable. The, the second bar in violet, uh, or, or the conventional control in, in green. So it means that family structure doesn't account so much of the, of the gap. Second uh, observation, the graph stresses the importance of initial condition. A large part of the gap already exists at the entry of the primary school. There is also a risk when not taking into account the initial condition to attribute to other factors some pre-existing differences. And so you can see also that income plays a larger, a larger role in yield. Much more of the family, much more than family structure, but we know they are quite correlated. So we observe roughly the same profile in the four countries that we could observe. France, Germany, England, and US, with a big role of initial condition and a quite uh, important role of income. So how much uh, family structure explain? Now, the, the family structure does not play so much. There are, however, some country differences. The family trajectory explains less than 2% of the, of the gap in France and Germany but while you're at seven to 10% in the US and uh, in England. If we compare this uh, family structure uh, contribution to the income contribution in the same country, uh, you can see that uh, family, family trajectory is a very small contributor comparing to income. So income is a much stronger contributor. So maybe policy should care more about the poverty of children after separation than the, the separation by, by itself. Then to summarize, uh, family instability is systematically associated with lower math and reading skills, but not so much once initial score or income are taken into account. So it's not the main contributor of the, of the social inequality. Family structure accounts only for a small extent and much less than, than income. Uh, family structure contribution is larger in the US and England relatively to France and Germany maybe because there is less welfare compensation for lone parents in, in, in this country. And that the, the big the added value of the, this uh, research has some limitation, several limitations, and, and most of the limitations are linked to country comparison issue. That's 
why we, we choose to focus on, on this aspect today. We use several longitudinal child cohorts that are not implemented at exactly the same period. So we have to, to use sometimes older cohorts in some country comparing to others. We are not interviewed at the same time. We do, of course, our best to make our outcomes comparable about, for instance, reading and math, we can find uh, this uh, score in, in most, uh, in, in a lot of countries, so they are comparable, comparable if you use uh, that score. But for other skills, such as non-cognitive score, uh, we do not find uh, always uh, all the information in all countries, that's why I saw that is why also we have to exclude, for instance, Japan and Netherlands for this gene. So we, we need non-cognitive comparative indicator. As concerns the variable of interest, the variable structure trajectory, we built it with the most common information in the four countries that we have. But for some child custody arrangement, for instance, we are not available to to observe them in all the countries. For instance, share custody arrangement, which is really an expansion in a lot of countries, was only asked in the French data set. Some crucial, crucial control are not also easy to harmonize. For instance, income or is not asked in the same way in all the countries. Uh, in some countries, it's pre tax income, in some other, it includes public transfer, in some other, not. So we have to, to struggle about that. And um, so uh, also, the marital status was not asked in the French uh, data set. So we, we, we encounter a lot of limitation, but in a way, we try to do our best. And this is raised the, the point that we need really to have more pre-harmonized longitudinal child cohort to improve our knowledge on child inequalities and how to struggle against them. So, but I will leave the floor now to Stoughton, or can I, I can see him, to ex we will explain the second example of the DICE project uh, and the challenge we have with uh, the data. So this is... Thank you so much, and Thorsten is here. Welcome, Thorsten. Yeah, sorry to everybody. I had uh, some uh, PC oh. laptop breakdown, and I had some problems oh. uh, to join in time. Sorry for that. So, uh, shall I make still some contribution? Of course. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is on, uh, in one project, we looked on the relevance of tracking social segregation for achievement gaps for parental education in lower secondary school and we look at France, Germany, England and the United States. Next slide please. So uh, we all know uh, in every country student achievement depends on social origin or on the socioeconomic status of the parents short SES and uh, there are many results uh, shown by PISA study by the study PISA that these differences vary across countries. And if you look at the countries and look at the education system, for example, the way the lower secondary education system is organized, we see that, uh, for example, in Germany, children are tracked at a very early age, at, in nearly all regions of Germany at the age of 10, and they attend different school types uh, with different curricula, and at the end, there are different qualifications. And other uh, countries like US or UK, they have, please still the slide, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the slide with a motivation introduction, please. And uh, some countries like the US and England, they have comprehensive schools, and uh, even in those countries, we see some type of tracking uh, because uh, advanced courses in mathematics or in other classes are offered. So there is a tracking, um, course by course tracking. And in France, France has only a very, very mild form of tracking. Uh, pride children might choose some special advanced classes in language. And um, 
peak performing students are sometimes assigned to smaller classes uh, with more support. But at the end, in all of these, uh, all students uh, receive the same final exams and the curricula are the same. So, and another point is uh, that countries differ in the way uh, residential segregation matters for the social composition at schools. Uh, we have stronger residential segregation and countries differ if they have more or less free choice. And we want to look at both and we want to look at this this, this longitudinal data. A lot of cross-country research use cross-sectional data. So, and now the next slide. Thank you very much. And uh, I think this slide is important because uh, we want to stress that we look at achievement growth. We do not look at a specific stage or age in the education system. We look, is there any further or is there any relevance of family socioeconomic status beyond and above performance we observed at entering lower secondary school? So we have a longitudinal perspective. So next slide, please, Anne. Thank you. And uh, we start with the tracking. As I already mentioned, um, countries differ in the way they track. And uh, some has external tracking, some has course by course tracking. And uh, if you look at the literature, the literature says, um, yes, um, previous performance is important for track attendance or track assignment, but uh, in addition, uh, social origin plays an important factor. And the literature says um, the social origin plays much more uh, or has more importance for track attending or course attending in the case of external tracking, and there's less importance in the case of course by course. And then the question is, uh, do these types of tracking differ in the way they influence um, progress in achievement? Curricula a little bit different. Um, the peers' motivation differs. And therefore, we can expect that tracking has some influence on achievement growth. And uh, the last point, as already mentioned in the introduction, we also look at the school composition. Uh, it's a socioeconomic status um, of the school. And does this have an impact? And especially if um, the financial situation depends on local taxes uh, and the recruitment of teacher depends uh, on the resources of the school. And if this differ um, by residential segregation, school composition should have a stronger impact on the achievement growth. So next slide, please. So uh, we use uh, data from DEP for France, from the National Education Panel Study for Germany, Early Childhood uh, Longitudinal Study for the US and the Millennium Cohort Study for England. And um, our outcome measure on mathematical skills and we rerun all the analysis also with reading skills is so measured in grade nine eight or 11, and we also have information on reading, uh, mathematics, and other information from grade five and six. So we look at the change over time. And um, as I'm too late, I was not so sure how much have you said, Anne, about, edu about uh, we classify SES, about parental education. Okay, <laughs> maybe we can discuss this later. So, and um, uh, this comparative research uh, is a challenge because uh, tests are survey specific. And for example, in England, uh, we use also nationwide uh, school exams in one case. And uh, in some surveys, test data are linked across grades and others not. So at the end, we decided to use fully standardized uh, test results, a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. The comparability of information, for example, we look at the SES composition of schools uh, for US and England. We have information on free lunch or free lunch or 
price reduced lunch. Uh, for France, we have information on the share of children, sort of blue color working families or non-working families. And for Germany, we have information on uh, the share of children from low status. So they are not perfectly uh, the same. So there, there are measurement issues. So then the availability of information. For example, uh, we look also at cost by cost tracking, uh, but unfortunately in the Millennium Court study, the information uh, is lacking if the student attends an advanced mathematics course. This is unfortunately a problem. We know if the student attends a grammar school, but, it's <laughs> but we, uh, this, uh, in this case, uh, information on um, cost by cost tracking. And we have difference in sampling design which leads also to difference in what we can estimate and what we can show. Uh, for example, for France, uh, Germany, and the US, we can estimate school fixed effects models. And I will present or present some results from the school fixed effects model. But unfortunately, uh, this is not possible for the Millennium Code study because it's an area sample based study and uh, we cannot perform this type of analysis. So next slide, please. Next slide, Anne. I tried. <laughs> and I have not uh, I cannot change it. Oh. Okay. Okay, and now I come uh, to the findings, and this is my last slide. <laughs> okay, if we look at changes over time, we see that um, above and beyond early achievement. Uh, SAS is especially important in Germany and England. So the picture is a little bit different if we only look on cross-sectional uh, data, but if you look on the progress, uh, it's especially strong in Germany and England. And then uh, in the first step, we estimated some fixed effects model. We want to set, look how much of these direct SES effect can we attribute to differences within school and to differences between school? If we look at SES effects within schools, they are the same in Germany, France, and the US, there is no difference. But as we saw very large uh, SES impact of, for Germany, this means the difference is between schools. So, and 50% of the overall SES gaps is between schools for Germany, for the uh, US it's one third and for um, France it's one fourth. So unfortunately we cannot reproduce this results with the data for England. So and then in the next step we want to look uh, is uh, this va variation can this variation be explained by um, school composition? Yeah, a sl small slight effect. We see a small slight effect uh, from school composition um, on reduce or, or a small effect. Uh, but, and here we can also use the data for England, uh, but the effect is uh, small and comparable across all four countries. And then in the last step, uh, we looked at our tracking indicators. And um, then we see uh, for the German case um, that the largest uh, part is explained um, by the, in Germany, where we have this external tracking and uh, only some low share is explained uh, for US and for France and for England. Uh, we only have the information on grammar school, which is not perfect, but this is also an important information and the share explained is also uh, low. So uh, overall, we see a difference across countries uh, in the direct effect of SES on achievement progress. And we see especially for the country with early external tracking, strong effect, which uh, explains uh, half of the SES effect above and beyond previous achievement. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dustin. Before we move to the second part of this event, there's a question for you here uh, regarding yeah. our presentation. So the question is how comparable are the measurements used for competence levels in the NAPS and provided by the British government? 
Are there any evaluation studies available? Um, there is part. Um, good question. <laughs> good question. Um, I'm not uh, sure how uh, if there's any evaluation study. There has been done some evaluation studies comparing um, the ECLS K data with the Millennium Cohort study in the paper by Bradbury. And for example, they looked um, on the broadness of measurement. Uh, the ECLSK data has uh, much more subdomains, I would say. And uh, there was some evaluation if uh, this changes the result. And the findings are no. But uh, this is a different age group. This was a different age group. This was a different domain. And both was testing. So there is no one to one uh, transferability to this question. Yeah. Thank you so much. So now we are moving to the second part of this event, which is the panel debate. And I'm super glad and honored to have with us today wonderful experts on education related uh, service. Uh, we have with us today Professor Gary Pollock, who is Professor of Sociology at the Manchester Metropolitan University. We have Silke Schneider, who is Deputy Head of the Team Questionnaire Design and Evaluation at the Survey Design and Methodology Unit at GESIS, Leibniz Institute for the Social Science. We have Francesco Avizati, Education and Skills Analyst at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. And we have with us Neil Kay, who is Research Fellow at Closer UL, UCL Social Science Institute. So welcome to all of you and let's not lose our precious time. I would like to start our conversation by asking you uh, what you believe is the most challenging issues nowadays when comparing educational trajectories or educational outcomes of individuals in different countries. It would be great if you could contextualize your answer into your professional experience so we understand where you come where you are coming from. Uh, shall we start with you, Sike? Thank you. Um for this very interesting and important question, the context of um, the results that we have heard earlier. Very interesting also to hear more about this project now. So this is an important question. I have been working with and on the international standard classification of education, which is commonly used to um, harmonize international education data um, in comparative surveys and also for ex post harmonization. I don't know whether this was used in the DICE project as well. Maybe that's something that Thorsten or Anne can comment on a bit later. Um, and so this is the main tool for comparing educational programs and qualifications across countries. Um, and well, I've been working on it for more than 15 years now. I was also involved in the 2011 revision of um, ISCAT and um, tried to implement it in several academic surveys, the European Social Survey, the European Values Study, the Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement in Europe, and um, also currently um, in the field, um, PIAC Cycle 2 by the OECD. So ne neither of these surveys in the end simply uses the official ISCAT codes, and with the exception of PIAC, the official mappings. And here is why. Um, I think there are some very severe shortcomings in the international standard classification of education for research purposes. Um, firstly, countries apply its criteria somewhat differently, which partly appears to be politically motivated even to make a country look better than it actually is in comparative education statistics. Um, it is not a hugely severe issue because I don't think it happens like regularly in every country and all over the place, but it is still the case, I think, that statistical offices and education ministries who are responsible for developing these CAT mappings are in a bit of a conflict of interest here. Um, and that is then at the cost of comparability and validity and also the reason why the academic surveys I mentioned um, previously sometimes 
um, in a few cases, deviate from the official mappings because we wanted to maximize comparability and validity. Um, but that also then means that uh, comparability with the official statistics is not perfect. So there is the question of, well, what do you optimize? Secondly, um, and I think that is a more severe problem here is that the international standard classification of education does not make certain distinctions that are quite important for measuring specific types of inequalities, um, which is the topic that we are interested in here, and that also differ across countries. So for example, um, Thorsten has mentioned the external tracking in the German school system, um, and ISCAD doesn't capture that tracking. So the selectivity of schools at the low secondary level in ISCAD is only captured by the vocational and general education distinction, um, which is within the lower secondary level, and therefore all lower secondary schools in Germany are classified as general. And we don't actually see the tracking in, in, in education attainment data there. Um, and we cannot study pathways. Um, the differences in the pathways and inequalities coming about these pathways um, using the official ISCAT codes with German data. In other countries, selectivities may be different. For example, it's more economic and less academic um, via an expanded private education or school sector or neighborhood segregation or even hidden within schools or school types as Thorsten showed. And at some sense, of course, you cannot get that all into a classification of educational programs and qualifications. So in that sense, it's also hard to tell where do you draw the line and how much do you want to include in a classification like this, which is already quite complicated. There's also examples at the tertiary level where in some countries we find programs and qualifications that do not require a high school diploma equivalent for entry, which is also maybe problematic in terms of comparability and validity. So say that the master crafts qualifications in Germany is regarded as tertiary and high education, but something like that doesn't actually exist in many countries, which means that also the um, medium to high gap that we have seen in the data may have to be interpreted differently in different countries because of what is considered as medium or high education of the parents in this case. So all this is invisible to ISCAT, and that's why I adapted the coding system itself for different surveys mentioned above to improve the differentiation of specific ISCAT categories to better be able to study educational inequalities while still making sure that the official ISCAT codes can still be derived. But that's still very limited in making real life differentiation education systems visible in survey data. So um, I think that has been already a lot and I will stop here. Thank you so much, Silke. Francesco, would you like to share what are the main challenges for you? Uh, yeah, I, I believe your question, your original question was about the current data landscape. Um, my own background and experience is in designing and analyzing large scale international assessments at the OECD, where I work on PISA in particular. And in this role, I also interact quite a lot with national education administrations. Uh, which have their own admin data. Um, with respect to large-scale assessment data, they are pretty much useless to compare individual trajectories or individual outcomes. They are designed for group-level comparisons. In that respect, they actually, I believe, I mean, perhaps uh, I'm a bit partial to this, but I, I believe they do a good job for outcomes, less so certainly for trajectories. Um, on the other hand, in many countries, you have now rich, very rich admin data through which one can reconstruct uh, every individual's in fact, trajectory through the education system. Uh, if I take the example of Italy and France, which I probably know best, uh, you can technically today follow the education career of any individual from the early elementary grade up to tertiary education, and along the way collect any standardized tests that they have passed, any exams, any, any results um, in the national examinations. It will still be hard, at least in these two countries, to link education identifiers with tax or social security identifiers because of data protection concerns. At least within the education system, you actually have the longitudinal data set that you can dream of uh, with admin data, at least theoretically or technically possible. Access is then another concern. But coming to the, to the most challenging data issues, so on the one hand, you have international large-scale assessment uh, at different points in the education career. So this has been shown in, uh, in how you can contrast uh, the, the, the end of primary education or the end of secondary education. So different snapshots over time and do something like a pseudo panel 
But if you do so, there is actually no guarantee that group membership is held constant across surveys. Uh, because of varying amounts of classification error, um, it may not have the same quality of measurement of uh, mother's education across surveys, for example, and also because of just outright different definitions of groups. Uh, the questions that are asked may not be the same across the different surveys. And on the other hand, if you rely on registry data and education trajectories reconstructed from them, to the extent that there is even any social demographic information in it, these registry data, they're, they're not designed for the purpose of comparing it across countries. So uh, both the outcomes and uh, the, 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 group the groups, they are probably defined very differently. So that's definitely a challenge that you have encountered even with panel data, but which still will, will exist with registry data. And perhaps lastly, but uh, this ed education registry data in federal countries, they're probably way behind what they can be uh, in uh, more centralized countries. Thank you so much, Francesco. Gary, would you like to share your perspective? Thank you. Um, thank you. So I, I would like to just focus on on context, on on the the, the uh, thinking about context, national context for education, national context for policy, and the that for me is probably the the, the largest challenge. So it sort of it relates to Jacqueline's question earlier. I think you know when you've got survey data and you're trying to do this comparison how robust are the comparisons which you're you're making when you've got different legal frameworks within which education takes place different ages at which children are eligible for a particular school year uh, different regimes of, of assessments um, you know diff different frequency of testing and different types of testing at different levels um, as well as the, the other issues which have come through from Silka and from Francesco there to do with the, the variations of data availability, survey data on the one hand and then the registry data on the other, and of course this desire to connect the two. Um, and so what we've got is the, the, this quite clearly from the DICE project and, and uh, it, it, people, scientists want to do this comparison, they want to be able to compare, compare what's happening in different countries, and yet what we've got is this co constant struggle with context. And so, um, you know, on, on the one hand, you can think, well, well, maybe what we should be doing is uh, is as a good national analysis and then doing a meta analysis of different national analyses. Or should we be trying to develop uh, comparable data sets, survey data sets? Because should we, or should and should we be trying to think about the ways in which the registry data, which Francesca's just said, is not comparable? Are, are there ways in which maybe there should be some some sort of work done at the OECD or at the cross national level to try to um, encourage greater levels of comparability? So, um, so for me, it's, I mean, I should say that you know, my, my work at the moment is all about developing a harmonized, an input harmonized uh, survey uh, across Europe, where we would try to iron out uh, um, these differences as best we can. But I'm, I'm not naive, you know, however much you design something uh, from the outset, trying to iron out uh, differences between countries, the context is always going to come back and uh, provide uh, a, a difficulty for you because of the different legal uh, and policy uh, structures. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Neil. Hi, and um, thank you to everyone who's, who's spoken so far. And I agree a, a lot with what the other panelists have said already. Um, just a bit on my background. I mean, I've got kind of three ways of looking at this. I've been involved in a kind of cross-national European project uh, looking at early school leaving and and all of the kind of issues around comparability of uh, of, of the data collection uh, and uh, data analysis that that entailed. Uh, I'm also uh, you know a user as a researcher of, of secondary uh, data, which again you know using the PISA data sets, the PIAC data sets, and and trying to um, analyze those in a, in a meaningful cross national way as well. Uh, and also my role at Closer, we have a lot of, uh, we do a lot of work uh, which looks at data harmonization across different cohort studies within the UK, but uh, I think a lot of the same principles apply uh, in, in cross-national uh, research as well. So that's kind of the three hats that I'm wearing when I come to, to think about these. And, and again, I want to agree with the previous panelists, I think one of the biggest challenges or 
the biggest challenge when doing this kind of research is about the the, the extent to which they're comparable, the comparability, uh, and externally valid uh, external validity of of the of the data. Uh, and this goes to what Gary was saying really about you know the context, how important the context are. Education systems typically are have historically you know grown organically within each country so there's no reason to expect that you know the at this point in time these uh, systems will in any way be comparable across country um you know to the extent that you can uh, you can directly compare parameters for example in analysis and then also um i think what's important to bear in mind when trying to do this kind of research is the relevance and in particular i'm thinking not just of the scholarly relevance you know can we compare these countries but also in terms of policy relevance uh, and to what extent uh something so from my uh, my um my own research career you know looking at early career uh, early school leaving has huge relevance and huge policy relevance in lots of countries within the eu but obviously and even this is going back before brexit uh even in the in the uk and england absolutely zero uh, resonance where all, all of the the policy um policies were around uh needs and um higher educational attainment etc so without anything to do with early school leaving so i think that's also a really important um aspect to bear in mind thank you so much neil we we had lots of questions to ask you but we are getting into the last 10 minutes of this webinar. So I would like to ask you very generally, uh, Gary just shared with us that he is in the process of creating a, a cross-national study looking at education. And uh, we know that uh, the DICE project has done a huge work trying to harmonize uh, longitudinal service that are already there. And uh, we heard from you and learned from you that there are lots of issues in between these two worlds. And I would like to ask you, like, if you would, if, what's your preference? If you, if, if I would give you a big grant to start an endeavor in this field of study, where would you start from? Perhaps, Francesco, you could start. Um, yeah, perhaps developing a bit the idea. Uh, I, I think I would start with the fact that well, the, the, we now have this rich admin data in many countries. We have rich uh, registry data, so any new study I think would need to build uh, on the linkage. I mean, would would need to be justified saying well, we we use what already exists to the extent that it's possible. Um, so it would make sense to have a pre-harmonized study, but which looks only at which kind of also pre 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 registers pre determines. Uh, the linkages to the registry, so so it it becomes um, it adds to the information that there is there. It is justified for national policymakers uh, because it adds one dimension of international comparability to what they kind of already could have from this admin data, which are and adds any research dimension to them. I mean, those admin data by definition they're not de designed for research use. They are uh, typically. Uh, used for administrative purposes for um directing money to schools for uh, for for, for uh, giving uh, out uh, degrees or uh, attributing uh, scholarships to students and so on so any anything i think would need to to take that dimension into account and i would say well my dream study would be one certainly that kind of combines uh, the power of international uh assessments with uh with with the longitudinal dimension that is much deeper probably than anything anyone can achieve in registry data thank you francesco silke um i think that the the idea of building on existing admin data is of course great we couldn't shouldn't burden respondents more than we act absolutely need to but um, as you have also mentioned earlier, some countries don't really have such registers. And I think in Germany, we're still quite far away from it, um, being one of those federalized countries where education is very difficult at a national level generally. Um, but I also think that having a, a study that is comparative from the outset, from the very start of study development would be amazing. So um, I have, um, 
heard about Gary Pollock's project and I was um, very excited about it, and particularly starting early in childhood and inequalities, because we know that uh, later inequalities very often go back to the very early days. And um, for this, we would have to, well, also improve and fine tune the tools that we already have um, in for, for questionnaires, but also for classification, measurement and comparability, because very often they were not developed for studying such phenomena, but they were developed for totally different purposes. And then they get used for something different because, well, that's what, what we have and it's great to have something to start with. So yeah, I mean, it is extremely expensive and challenging to organize such a study. And I'm very, um, well, grateful that people are taking this on. <laughs> Um, and I very much hope for your success in the long run, but I know it is, it is very difficult. But if I could wish for something, then it is a longitudinal panel study that is ex ante harmonized in as many respects as possible, <laughs> a dream to come true. Neo, can, you he can, I, can we hear your thoughts about this? Sure, I, I agree with what's been said already. And, you know, generally speaking, you know, prospective harmonization is better in terms of the measurement quality than retrospective it also is you know it, it it's slightly more slightly less time and resource heavy because retrospective harmonization is you know, hugely expensive and hugely resource intensive not to say that prospective harmonization isn't but is slightly less so generally speaking perspective harmonization is preferable although of course you know you need to then take into account how things will change in the future which of course people don't know you know how concepts change and how uh, how things are measured change in terms of the question of how uh, you know what you know what would you do if you were given money for this study i think a lot of it this this depends on the scope of the study, I mean, which countries are, are you intending to include? Which ones are excluded? On what basis are they? How similar are they? How homogenous are they as a as a set of countries to start with? Because that will, I think, affect the extent to which not just uh, you can have comparable measurements of of concepts like you know socioeconomic status, educational achievement, and all of the other control factors. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think you need to factor that in, uh, that you can have a kind of comparability of the concept you're trying to measure, which may muddy the exact kind of one-to-one -one measurement issue. So again, it comes back to what Gary was saying earlier about context and how much that's going to drive the ability to, uh, to produce comparable results at the end of the study. Thank you, Neil Gary, the owner of the amazing survey. <laughs> <laughs> it's a developing survey. Well, this is all music to my ears, of course. It sounds great that people are uh, seem to think that it, it is a good idea to have an ex-ante harmonized uh, survey, which is what we've been working on for some time. And of course, Silke mentioned the SHARE project earlier, the, the Survey of Health, Aging, Retirement in Europe, which is the template in many ways that we're, we're, we're following. Now, the SHARE project, it shows that these things can be done. Um, and, and that, of course, there are some compromises that need to be made um, because you can't do everything with, a, with an input harmonized survey because, because there are some things which only work at a national level. So you've, there are some simplifications that need to be made. So it's not, it's, it's not going to deliver uh, everything. Um, and you've got to be quite selective, I think, as to what you what your focus is going to be. So, I mean, this event is focusing on education, which, of course, would be a component of such a survey. But, the, the you know, if, if you're what we're working on at the moment is a notional 30 minute questionnaire with eight year olds and one hour questionnaire with their main carer. What can you get in that in, in relation to you know health, education, uh, child development and so forth? There's various compromises that need to be made. Uh, they've got to be translatable, uh, they've got to have some sort of longitudinal relevance and so forth. But, you know, share shows it can be done. We think it can be done. It is expensive. Um, uh, it's something which requires us to get um, a lot of support at a national level, at a stake, uh, at policymakers level, uh, ministry level within governments, because these things are expensive. Francesco's 
uh, talking quite quite rightly about the importance of, of uh, linked uh, linking to registered data, which is what we are trying to facilitate. But the registered data is only going to get you so far. It's not going to get you the subjective well-being. It's not going to get you the experience of bullying and how that has an impact on educational uh, outcomes. And I think that the trajectories which have been talked about earlier are very much the kind of trajectories which, which have got a component for which subjective feelings would be relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I don't see questions here at the Q&A. So let's uh, finalize this discussion by asking Thorsten, if I may, Thorsten, uh, about your work on exposed harmonization for the DICE project. Is it that bad? Like, can you say something about it? Like now that we know, like we all dream with uh, pre-harmonizing uh, studies, what about the ex post harmonization? Is it that 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 bad? Shall, would you do this again? Or? Yeah, I think so. I, I would do it again. Uh, it's clear in the uh, uh, country specific data set, you have specific information. And if you start with pre harmonized, I'm a big fan of pre harmonization, <laughs> uh, you might lose some important information. This might be, you have to balance. So, and I would also give uh, some answer to Silke because Silke raised uh, this question. Uh, I think it was very clear that we do not work with Silke from the beginning for different reasons. And uh, we had some classification like full tertiary pro program as high education, no short program in the tertiary. And then we had a lot of discussion how do we define what is the country specific, country specific expected minimum of education so and then we double checked with other data sources uh, how homogeneous are the groups and not and so but uh, yeah i think both uh, uh, coming back to your original question both uh, things are worth trying uh, exposed harmonization and uh, the way Gary Bollock goes, we should also have more pre-harmonized cross-national studies. So both. Thank you so much, Thorsten. And I thank you all our panelists and uh, participants in this meeting it has been very, very nice. I have learned a lot. I hope all of, all of you learned a, a, something as well. Uh, I'm leaving here in the chat the link for the DICE project. If you want to learn more about the project, the participants and the outputs, it's all in there. And uh, I hope to see you in our future events. Thank you so much. <laughs>